What comes to your mind when you hear the words racial segregation? You probably think of black and white pictures in history textbooks showing segregated bathrooms, drinking fountains, and restaurants. You probably think of the civil rights movements, Rosa Parks' bravery on a public bus, Martin Luther King's infamous I Have a Dream speech, and the actions of other black activists who changed the way America viewed racial diversity. You are probably relieved that America had these activists to fight for minority rights, and now, thankfully, we don't have to live in a racially segregated society anymore. Right? Wrong. Racial segregation still exists. There's no laws that exist that segregate America, but there is modern-day, de facto, or by custom, racial segregation among communities. You've probably noticed that some neighborhoods have a very high minority concentration, and some neighborhoods have a very low concentration. And from your own observations, you can probably tell that unfortunately, poorer neighborhoods typically possess more minorities. But many people do not recognize the magnitude of racial residential segregation. Joseph Williams from U.S. News and World Report writes that America is just as racially segregated as when Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Fair Housing Act of 1968, 50 years ago. This is the racial distribution of residences in Los Angeles, California. The darker the shade of an area, the more concentration of African Americans living there. You'll notice that there is a clear separation of districts that are largely black and districts that are largely white. The same is true for Detroit, Michigan, Washington, D.C., and Atlanta, Georgia. White affluent neighborhoods usually look something like this. Areas with the lowest minority concentration are typically very well off. They are usually suburbs with green grass, large estates, and lots of space. Compare these neighborhoods to these neighborhoods, with black residents being the majority. However, keep in mind that the neighborhoods being pictured now are not poverty-stricken areas that you would find in the inner cities. Rather, they are suburbs that possess a much higher minority concentration than the suburbs previously shown. People. Richard Rothstein of the Economic Policy Institute writes, quote, The share of black students attending schools that are more than 90% minority has grown in the last 20 years from about 34% to about 40%. 20 years ago, black students typically attended schools in which about 40% of their fellow students were low income. It is now about 60%. In cities with the most struggling students, the isolation is even more extreme. The most recent data shows, for example, that in Detroit, the typical black student attends a school where 2% of students are white and 85% are low income. This racial segregation of schools has been intensifying because the segregation of neighborhoods has been intensifying, end quote. Rothstein also finds that African American men aged 13 to 28 are 10 times more likely to live in poverty than white men in the same age range. It is not surprising that areas with more poverty also possess more crime, as lower income, less educated residents are more likely to turn to crime as a means of survival. However, even though there is more crime, recent data has shown that our perceptions of crime severely overestimate the actual amount of crime in majority black neighborhoods. In a publication from the University of Chicago, professors Lincoln Quillen and Deva Pagger find, quote, the percentage of a neighborhood's black population is significantly associated with the perceptions of the severity of the neighborhood's crime problem. Survey respondents consistently rate blacks as more violent prone than any other American racial or ethnic group. A combination of negative media depictions of African Americans, historical stereotypes, and ethnocentric biases are likely combined to form distorted perceptions in which the association of blackness and criminality is systematically overestimated. African Americans have been found to receive harsher judgments of guilt and punishment than white defendants in otherwise identical cases. In experiments in which black and white figures perform identical acts, the black figure's behavior is usually seen as more threatening and predatory than the white figure's behavior. Systematic barriers such as poverty, a poor education, and associated stereotypes of danger and crime make it not impossible, but very difficult for an inner-city black child to succeed. It is very rare for a child born into a rough home life without money or access to a quality education to have any means to escape the cycle of poverty. 
Ultimately, this is why minorities having less than white people is perpetuated in society, and why after half a century, America is still just as segregated. In her book titled White Fragility, Robin D'Angelo describes just how much of American institutions are completely controlled by white people. Take a look at these statistics from 2016 to 17. Unfortunately, this complete systematic and institutional control can never be reversed unless we find a way to desegregate ourselves. Let's talk about where we live. Here are the percentages for racial distribution in the United States. Obviously, white is a large majority, and the larger minorities include African Americans, Hispanics or Latinos, and Asians. Here is the distribution of race at Revere and our school rank. Compare these statistics to two other schools near us. Firstly, Firestone High School is a part of Akron Public Schools and is approximately 7.4 miles away from Revere High School. Firestone High School actually has a majority minority, as the largest group at Firestone is African Americans. Next, we have Woodridge High School, another public high school that is approximately 8.3 miles away from Revere. While it still has a white majority of its students, Woodridge has more racial diversity than Revere and is the closest to the actual racial distribution in America of the three schools. Notice, among these three schools, the more of the student body is made up of African Americans, the lower the state ranking. Let's see what the students at these schools think about racial diversity within their school district. At Revere, it's not the most diverse school as like Copley or like Akron Public. It's very much like homogenous. I think diversity at our school is pretty low. <laughs> I, I don't really know how to quantify it, but I'd say that there's very few people who like really represent you know, the different cultures. I feel like we have a lot more diversity because we have inner city students who go there regionally and then other students that come from the STEM programs. So we have a lot more than like the average Northeast Ohio school, in my opinion. The racial diversity is very different in Firestone. If you're walking in the hallway, you know, there's black and white people mixed together. There's not really any segregation. It's very diverse compared to a lot of other schools. I feel like um, our school is made up of a good portion of a lot of different races. Students have different experiences based on their race and the races of their peers as they go through elementary school, middle school, and high school. Leah and Jalil are two juniors who, while they have attended the same school in the same grade, they have much different outlooks on racial diversity at their school. I don't think I've personally ever seen it in, like, near me. I don't think I've ever experienced it, like, in front of my face before. I have heard a lot of um, racial slurs thrown towards me and my friends. I feel like people at Woodridge have become like more accepting of other people of other races compared to people who are at, like all black or all white schools. Like we're still kind of segregated in the school. The black people hang around the black people, the white people hang around the white people. I don't know why it's so segregated. Um, probably, probably just by the way we act, like why the way other like black people act, like where they've come from, like they've come from like ghettos and stuff, and like these people have lived, like these white people have lived in this area for a long time, and I think that's like that's just like getting to know people, like mm -hmm. people don't really like want to get to know you when you just moved in. Oftentimes, subtle discrimination occurs at schools regardless of the diversity of the student body. While Nemdi attends a school with much less diversity than Caitlin's school, both have experienced subtle discrimination. Sometimes there are really insensitive things that are said, and that's because they never really run into a situation where someone's gone like, hey, you know, that's not exactly the right thing to say. This is like in like sixth grade, and I wanted to send an emoji, and it was like one of those people emojis and it was the time when they came out with the skin, mm -hmm. skin range. So I was gonna like send an emoji with my skin color, black. And then my friend said, no, choose the white one. That one's more pretty. And I was really shaken there. I knew it was wrong, but I just like sent the emoji anyway. And I just, yeah, that's like one of the few times in which I, I really felt it. I have seen racial discrimination 
um, there's this one white principal and she talks about dress code a lot. And so if a black person is wearing something they shouldn't, then she'll yell at them and send them to ISS. But if she sees a white person wearing the same thing, literally the same exact thing, she'll just talk to them nicely and ask them if they have a sweater like to cover up their shoulders or something like that. And so that's just really not right. Among the six students I interviewed, the general consensus was that a more diverse student body makes for a more tolerant and socially aware group of students. Because when I went to Medina freshman year, there was no diversity and there were a lot of racists. And now there's so much diversity that if a white person like said something out of pocket, then they would get called out immediately and it wouldn't happen again. Racial diversity makes people more tolerant and more open-minded and more well-rounded. I think that it makes you a completely different person when you go to a place where everyone's like you you don't realize that it impacts you negatively but when you learn so much and see so much like the more information you have in your head the better person you'll be i totally think it positively impacts the student body to have you know a mixture of different races than just one because you're able to come together and share ideas culturally or how, however it may be I think that Revere needs to be like needs to talk more about diversity in our school because it's kind of a subject that's kind of brushed away. You know, people make jokes about how it's like I don't know ninety seven percent white or something like that. But I think like no one really does anything or like talks about how we can like improve ra racial relations. So I think that students and teachers need to be more combative about racism. Now that we've identified a major problem affecting minorities in America, we are left with the final question, what can we do about it? Most schools do not teach about de facto segregation and rather only talk about segregation as a thing of the past in the South. Rothstein tells us that, quote, for example, in over 1,200 pages of McDougal Little's widely used high school textbook, The Americans, a single paragraph is devoted to 20th century discrimination in the North. It devotes one passive voice sentence to residential segregation, end quote. This method of education raises children thinking that racial segregation is no longer a problem. Instead of being taught to be colorblind or ignore race completely, we need to be able to acknowledge existing problems in order to address them. Educating about modern residential segregation is a critical step in spreading awareness. Secondly, higher education institutions have adopted affirmative action policies, making it easier for minorities to be admitted or to receive financial aid. For example, on May 17, 2019, six days ago, the SAT announced that they will be adding adversity scores to outline certain hardships a student may have faced during their education. To us, many of these policies may be hard to swallow as someone who has grown up in a privileged neighborhood. School is hard. We all work incredibly hard. Don't we deserve just as good a shot at college admissions? However, the thing about affirmative action is that it seeks to address the issue as a whole, not just for individuals. And allowing those people to escape segregated ghettos to go to a top university is perhaps the only way to elevate the race as a whole. Additionally, creating diverse environments on college campuses leads to more knowledge and tolerance. Tom Jacobs of UC Berkeley finds that growing up surrounded by diversity does lead to more knowledge and tolerance. Jacob writes, quote, The results suggest beliefs about race that contribute to prejudice take a long time to develop, and that their development depends to some extent on the neighborhoods in which the children grow up, end quote. This subtle discrimination and segregation is rooted in our customs as Americans, and what we need is a cultural change. As we ourselves are in a mostly white, privileged area, we are the very people who need to help make the change. Thank you.